Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. There were two items in closed session that were discussed. The first item was conference with legal counsel existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9. This is a pending litigation involving the city of Hollister et al. versus PG et al. On this matter, uh, direction was given to city staff and the city manager to continue negotiations with uh, defendant uh, Violia in that case. With regards to the second matter, the conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to, pursuant to government code section 54956.9, one potential case involving the 400 block referendum for which the mayor was recused. No action was taken on this item. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Tonight we have a proclamation for Kids of the Park 25th anniversary and also a certificate of recognition for someone very special here. Do we have a representative from Tina Garza? <laughs> Whereas Kids at the Park is an annual health and safety fair held at Dunn Park in Cal Hollister, California that educates children in San Benito County to be safe from unintentional injury since 1993. And now therefore, I, Ignacio Velasquez, Mayor of the City of Hollister, on behalf of the entire council, do hereby proclaim Kids at the Park 2018 to be held in the memory of Janet Graham. Um, thank you for the proclamation. We appreciate it. Uh, the city of Hollister has been a part of Safe Kids Coalition um, for the past 25 years involved with this e annual event. And for the past seven years, we have be been the lead agency and our staff and along with our park staff have helped put on this annual event. And we're proud this year to acknowledge Janet Graham, who was the founder of our Kids at the Park. And thank you for the recognition. Tonight we're also recognizing a very special employee here at the City of Hollister, and we're going to present her with our Certificate of Performance Recognition. Daisy, you're on there. Want to come back up? <laughs> Daisy does a lot of great work here at the City, and she's always uh, making sure I do get my mail. She runs down the street for me, so I appreciate everything, and I'm sure all the city council members and staff, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This is truly <laughs> um, undeserved. Um, I enjoy really working with everyone here at the city and giving back to the community, and I hope to spend more years there. So thank you, Christine and Cheryl and Billy for everything. Well, Daisy, I just want to say thank you because you without you and your help and you really stepped up with you know helping me with deputy city clerk duties and all kinds of other things that you do for all the other departments and I know all you other departments know who you are when you need translation not just verbally but written she's always there helping out willing to help out and not just helping out but with a smile so thank you very very much thank you and she does and she and she does a good job with the panic button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if I could also just echo everything that, Daisy, um, that Christine said about Daisy. Uh, the most important thing for me is that she does come to work every day. I, it at least appears like she has a good time when she's here. Um, and we try to have a, a lot of fun. So again, thank you for all your help. Um, it means a lot to me. You keep me at least straight. Um, she usually tells me first thing in the morning where I got to be and when. So um, my day makes it, makes it a lot easier for me to know that somebody's there watching and has my back so thank you Daisy I appreciate it Daisy I, I just want to chime in on this as well thank you for being the person that you are the friendliness not over in person but over the phone and thank you for the excellent bilingual skills we appreciate that thank you thank you all right council we're gonna to move to the consent agenda are there any items you'd like to pull do we have any items from the public? 
No, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I need to recuse myself from items A6 and A7 due to the fact that my personal attorney was, his firm was one of the applicants. <clears throat> okay. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent calendar as amended with the reclusion of mm -hmm. Councilman Clear Bauer, A6 and A7. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. <laughs> We're going to move to public input. This is time for anyone in the audience to speak on any item not on the agenda and within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. Speaker cards are available in the lobby, are to be completed and given to the city clerk before speaking. When the city clerk calls your name, please come to the podium, state your name and city for the record, and speak to the city council. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes with the maximum of 30 minutes per subject. Please note that state law prohibits the city council from discussing or taking action on any item not on the agenda. Do we have any speaker cards? No, Mr. Mayor. No. All right. We are on a roll here. Let's move to D1, City Manager's Report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one quick thing. Um, the high school, um, Sean at the high school has reached out to, this, uh, to city staff and to the council um, regarding a tour of their new facilities. Um, if anybody would like to go, please let us know. Um, I can have Mary start to arrange that. Um, I've been on a couple of tours um, recently. Uh, the things that they have going on at the high school are, are very impressive. Um, a lot of work is being done. They've got a first class facility. Um, and I think every, every day it's, it's getting closer and closer. So we should be extremely proud as a community of, of what they've been able to accomplish. So again, if you have any um, uh, desires to go on a tour, please feel free to let us know and, we, and we'll arrange that for you. I Thanks just have much. a question. Did, sure. did they provide a date when uh, they're available for the tour? I think, I think Sean said that we can do it whenever it's convenient for you. Okay, because I know I'm, I'm scheduled on Monday. Oh. So. Well, apparently okay. you. In case anybody you else wants to come high. along. <laughs> All right. Good, excellent. Is that it? Yeah. All right. We're going to move to item E1. Mr. Mayor, before we get started, I need to recuse myself from this item as I recuse myself from the original selection process for the dispensary uh, selection due to a conflict of interest with one of the sites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I will also be recusing myself for the same reasons. Good evening. Sorry, I was waiting for my PowerPoint. That's okay. I'll go ahead and start. It's not until later. All right. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. The item before you tonight is for the approval of a cannabis use permit for Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine to operate a medical cannabis dispensary. At its meeting of August 14th of 2017, the City Council directed staff to prepare and bring back Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine for consideration of approval. This approval will allow the applicant to proceed with necessary permits for the establishment of the future dispensary and apply for a site and architecture review at the planning department, at the planning commission level. Briefly, the project is located at 773 San Felipe Road, south of Wright Road within the North Gateway Zoning District. The future building is expected to be approximately 2,160 square feet in size. Overall, the site will serve as a unified camp cannabis cultivation park totaling approximately 9.14 acres in size. The future dispensary meets all sensitive use restrictions as defined in Hollister Municipal Code section, and no religion establishments or conforming residences are located within 150 feet, and no schools or public or private, are located within the 600-foot radius either. Um, in front of you, I, I've put a, um, it's very brief. Um, the, the applicant plans to demolish the existing building and bring in a pre-manufactured building once that's completed. Um, that's just sort of like a, a tentative image of what it would possibly look like. No, oh. <laughs> it's on now. <laughs> um, this is this is the the site. 
um, the, 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 the dispensary would run San Felipe Road, which runs parallel, but the, I just sort of wanted to show um, where sort of like the, the bigger picture of, of the future operations that will also come before the city council for approval later. However, the dispensary is um, where the, the red um, sort of like half diamond shape is, and it just kind of shows the, the radius is there for the uh, sensitive uses. Um, the, the picture to the left is the current building, and the picture to the right would be what the, what the future building would look like. With that, staff recommends that the City Council approve the following motion and adopt Resolution 2018-142, approving a cannabis use permit and develop an agree development agreement for Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine. Are there any questions for staff? Okay. Any questions from Council? No questions? At this time, I'll open it for public hearing. Do we have any speakers? Gary Coates. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, Gary Coates here on behalf of Monterey Bay Alternative Medicine. Uh, we're very pleased to be before you this evening. I know it's been a long process going through. We've uh, done our lot line adjustment to create the lot. Uh, the red arcs that you saw on that map are the 600 foot, so we've maintained and stayed out of the 600 foot area for everything in the uh, region. The uh, project that we're looking at is a factory built type unit. It's a prefab unit that can come in that will, it'll have a poured foundation but then be come in and placed on that foundation and built. Uh, we'll be providing parking, uh, landscaping, cleaning up the front yard area. Uh, we've done some weed control out there but we'll be doing actually some additional work out there. We're also working with your fire department to let them utilize the old structure as a training structure. Uh, for them to use for their folks uh, or PD, whomever may use it for the interim because we'll be going at least probably 60 days through the process to get us to a point of actually construction work on the site. So we'll be allowing the city to utilize that building which will help us and hopefully the city as well. We concur with your staff. Staff's done a very excellent job in reviewing, has been very helpful for us in guiding us through the process since we're the first uh, dispensary that's coming through the city and want to be uh, obviously the best that we can with the city. So, Mr. Mayor, all mem and council members, I'll make myself available for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do we have any other speakers? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay, this time we'll close public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. I move that we approve resolution 2018 142. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. 3 0 vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will move to item E2. We'll hang on for a second, we'll wait for Councilmember Clower to come back. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Um, this next item is to conduct a public hearing and uh, adopt the resolution confirming the boundary and assessment for the Landscape and Lighting District 93-1 and order the levy and collection of the assessment for the fiscal year 2018-2019. On May 25th, 2018, the uh, notice of public hearing was published in the local newspaper. And with that, staff has prepared the final engineer's report, budget, diagram, uh, map collection role um, and diagram to complete the renewal for the council um, to consider. Okay. Any questions from council? <coughs> no. This time we will open it for public hearing. Do we have any speakers? No, Mr. Mayor. At this time we will close public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. 2018-143. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. The motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll move to item F1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Oh, um, oh. oh gee. I know. <laughs> the brokerage where I hang my license is mentioned in the lease agreement, so for that reason, I have to recuse myself. Okay. <clears throat> I 
I forgot, sorry. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, the item that you have before you is, uh, you've seen a, a few different times now, it is a lease agreement between us and uh, Anne-Marie Barragon uh, for 211 Fifth Street. It is a, uh, a location just um, essentially across the street, kind of kitty quarter from the uh, fire department. It will be uh, proposed to be used for housing of uh, the code enforcement officers, uh, cannabis, and the housing authority, as well as our um, affordable housing uh, uh, staff member as well. Um, Originally, I think we were shooting for a, essentially a 10-year lease. Um, the council asked that we re reduce that to five years, so uh, we now have it at a, at a, at a five-year term um, at a rate of $2,800 a month. Um, if there's any other questions, I would uh, be more than willing to answer them. Any questions for yeah. council? Council Member Friend? Your description of where it is, it's kitty corner from the... Yeah, I, I mean, it's actually room. right next door to Whiskey Creek. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a block away. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I kind of not that up. I would know where Risky Creek is. But, uh, <laughs> I understand. Right. So where the barber shop is. Yeah, exactly. Well, the barber shop. <laughs> they do. They do have your picture hanging there. So. <laughs> At the barber shop. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've never seen each other there, Ray. Yeah. No. Okay. Is there any other questions? Do we have any uh, speaker cards? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. There's a motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Thank you. We're going to move to item G1. Reports from city council members regarding their committees. Council member Clower. Uh, no reports, uh, but we do have an intergovernmental meeting this Thursday morning. Okay. Council member Frank. Yes, I do have a report. We did have a fire committee meeting, and at that meeting, the draft agreement between the city, the county, and the San Juan Batista was discussed as to uh, the continuation of the agreement between the city and the county and San Juan and continued fire services and it's uh, going through the process right now. We have another meeting this coming Thursday. So. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Vice Mayor Luna. I do not have any uh, committee meetings, Mr. Mayor. I do not have any updates either. We will move to informational reports. Council Member Clower. Yeah, I just want to say congratulations to everybody who's going to be graduating this week uh, at the high school and the junior highs, and just hopefully everybody will have a safe grad night. I'm pretty sure they're doing sober grad night again, so that's kind of the place to be, I think, if you're graduating. And then as soon as that's over with, the high school is going to be starting a lot of construction uh, on site and then off on the roads as well. So uh, along with the road work that we're going to be doing as a city here in the next few weeks, there's going to be a lot of orange cones and signs out so please just be careful when you're driving especially at night thank you councilman friend yeah i just have one thing i want to thank everybody that showed up for the memorial services at the vets building on memorial day so it was about 100 150 people at the ceremony it was very nice 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 vice mayor luna i guess i just want to say um i attended the Retirement dinner for Leo Alvarez, which was well attended by the fire department, and uh, I truly enjoyed it. Um, I was able to present a plaque on behalf of the city, and it was quite an honor to be there because I got to see some of the firefighters that used to be there with the city that came back to honor Leo, and I just wanted to thank the fire department for the invitation. That's my report. Thank you. I was invited to a, attend a presentation for the sixth graders at the AAA Academy, their instructor, Ms. McNett, and their vision of a youth center in our community using our existing um, rec center. So incredible presentation, and I'm looking forward to having them come out and do the presentation at several different committees and here at the city council meeting one day. Really. A, great group of young people that have a great vision so I'm looking forward to that presentation in the future 
All right, we're going to move to city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I really don't have much. I um, just want to make sure that you all remember June uh, June 11th, next Monday night, we have a special meeting uh, related to the 218 process for sewer rates. Um, I hope everybody can be here for that and attend. At I will not be there. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Um, and then um, June 18th, um, our last uh, meeting of this fiscal year uh, will be a relatively large one. We'll have budget, hopefully the trash uh, ag agreement uh, are the two big, big items that are going on that particular evening as well as some other things. So um, I hope everybody's gonna be able to be present for that as well. Okay, city attorney. Nothing to report, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Chief? Just one item, uh, Tuesday the 12th, the uh, Special Olympics uh, torch run will be going through town. Starts at Trace Pinos at 7.45, ends at Hollister PD, if we don't die, <laughs> around 10, 15. June 12th? A.M. June 12th? Is that what? June 12th. On Tuesday, huh? Okay. City Clerk? Just want to remind everyone that tomorrow's voting day, so get out there and vote. I'll be working the polls, so I mean, I'll be out um, be doing the election polls. Oh, I told I was told working by my the family. polls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my family said. Let it go. Let it I say it wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we'll move to item G three. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, we have representatives from the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. They'll be providing a report to you on the Energy Watch Beacon Program and Hollister's community-wide greenhouse gas inventory. You have that uh, in your report. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Bertrand and Omri Berto. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members. Um, I'd like to provide first the brief introduction and then Omri will actually be going over the details of your 2015 greenhouse gas inventory, but I, I want to provide a happy spoiler if I can. Um, we've been doing this since 2005 through 2015, so we've done the 2005, the 2010, and the 2015 for all the jurisdictions in the Ambeg region. And our goal uh, was to follow the state law at the time, AB 32, which to, was to reduce greenhouse gases by 15% by 2020. And it's very exciting, as you'll see in the detail from Omri, you've already, you've, ex you've achieved those goals. So um, you're well on your way for the next goal, which is the 2030 20, target of 40%. But <laughs> um, if we could advance the slide. Oh, I do it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Me, the button. <laughs> Good luck. Where? What? Point, point at this oh, computer. No, nope. point it right there. There you go. Did we turn it off again? I'm trying. Okay. Oh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> now try. Ah, oh, thanks. Even better. Trick, uh -huh. trick to you again. <laughs> Daisy, oh, Daisy so would you okay. show Okay, I'll just say that. advance. Okay, yeah. um, this is just a quick update. We've been working with with all of our jurisdictions and the city of Hollister, as I said, since 2006. And what we've done is energy efficiency. I will say, doing all the buildings back in 2006 with the city of Hollister was the first direct install project that was ever done in PG&E territory in the entire area of the territory and that started the whole we did it as a pilot and that started something that then has become the hugest thing that they do with all jurisdictions and so i always tell the story that hollister truly the staff at hollister public works were the cutting edge the leading edge that started that level of working with our jurisdictions so since 2006 into 2018 you can see the stats um, we have, we're looking at doing 6 million KWH for this year, 
add to a total of 98 million already achieved. What's really important when you look at that is when you take that money that's not being spent on buying energy, instead you've got 74 million in the community that's being used other ways within the region. So that's really exciting. And then another big thing that we do is we work to help access funding for, uh, for energy efficiency. So for all of the, the school districts here in the region, we've, we, our team has been the one who put together their California Energy Commission uh, plan in order to access their Prop 39 funding. So we've worked very closely with all the school districts, which is a lot of fun, and we've really enjoyed that. Could we do the next slide? And what I'm really happy to share with you tonight before I turn it over to Omri is uh, when you go to the League of Cities meeting this uh, September down in Long Beach, uh, the city of Hollister is going to be re receiving an award again. It's going to be a gold level spotlight award from the Institute for Local Government. <laughs> And that is really exciting because last year you received a silver level and that was for the energy efficiency you would achieve from 2010 until 2016. And now looking at 2016 until now, you've achieved that incremental improvement that you're being recognized with the gold award. And I truly wanna thank you for your commitment to energy efficiency, so thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Omri, and he'll go over the details of the 2015 greenhouse gas inventory. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so to start off, uh, just a few definitions uh, about the greenhouse gas inventory, just to put things in context. Uh, baseline year just means the, the first year that we did the inventory, and so in our case, that is 2005. Then greenhouse gases, uh, I think we all know what those are, but the greenhouse gases that we're looking at in this inventory are CO2, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. Um, then we, when we look, the way that we calculate uh, emissions are by looking at what's happening in the community and then multiplying that by what we call an emissions factor. And so all that is is let's say that we have electricity use that would be happening in the community then we multiply that by a factor to give us the amount of emissions that this electricity represents. And then finally, what we mean by a community-wide greenhouse gas inventory, which is what we're doing now, is simply that we're trying to have it as accurate a picture of the emissions that are occurring within uh, your community. So from 2005 to 2015, as Elizabeth has said, uh, there was a reduction in 15% uh, in emissions. And so what that means is that you have met the 2020 statewide target five years early, which is really impressive. Um, and then to go over it sector by sector, um, in the residential sector, there was a 13% reduction. And uh, in general, what may have impacted the, and caused this reduction would be changes in electricity and natural gas use, and also the fact that over the years, electricity is becoming cleaner as we have more and more renewables that enter the mix, uh, the electricity generation mix. Then we have commercial and industrial, and that was a 51% reduction. And um, the emissions are impacted by the same factors as the residential emissions. Um, but also there has been a CPUC, a California Public Utilities Commission, rulemaking proceeding on data privacy issues and they've enacted new rules about energy data access. And so that might have reduced the amount of data that we have access to to create the inventory, which would have significantly reduced the, the emissions. So part of that decrease uh, would be because of that. Then in the transportation sector, we have a 52% increase. And the way that these emissions are calculated are by uh, modeling the amount of automotive travel that occurs within uh, Hollister. And there, what happened is that the statewide model that's used is um, switching over and starting to use GIS data. And so with that GIS data, data that might have previously been included um, in unincorporated San Benito County, uh, may now be counted as uh, in the Hollister to totals. And so that would have contributed to part of the increase. Then for the solid waste sector, you have a 20% uh, increase and that may be due to increases in the amount of solid waste being sent to landfills. And then finally, you have um, 
2% reduction in wastewater emissions, uh, which is due to the amount of wastewater that's been treated that's been reduced a little bit. Now to look at the 2015 uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how uh, they're uh, spread out across the sector. The biggest sector is uh, transportation at 33%. And what that is is travel on local roads, both from gasoline uh, and diesel, from trucks and cars. Then we have um, the residential sector and the commercial industrial sector at 30% and 25%. And those are your energy emissions, both natural gas and electricity. And then the solid waste sector at 11%, which is emissions from sending waste to landfills. And then finally, the wastewater, uh, which is 1%, which is the emissions from treating wastewater. And now, if we just look at the energy use piece of the pie, which is 55% of emissions, what's really interesting is that you are seeing that 52% of emissions are from natural gas and 48% are from electricity. And so if you want to strategize towards meeting the 2030 targets, uh, what we have to think about is that those 48% that are electricity uh, will be offset by joining Monterey Bay Community Power, but you still have that 52% uh, of emissions that are natural gas and will stay there. And so it might be worthwhile to look at strategies of how to reduce these 52% of emissions um, so that we can meet the 2030 target. And now just to bring it back to more the AMBAG region, uh, from 2005 to 2015 in AMBAG overall, there has been a 21% uh, in reduction. And what is interesting if we look at the AMBAG region spy is that transportation uh, is getting a little bit bigger. Uh, and same thing with commercial and industrial, it's a bit bigger than in Hollister. So just some context there. And uh, now if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Any questions from the council? No? Just a comment. Yeah, Vice Mayor Linda. Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank Elizabeth. Um, I had the honor of receiving the award on behalf of the city last year. And as we sat around the table with other cities' representatives, everybody was going up for the goal. And we, smaller cities, we were all looking at each other and saying, someday we'll get the goal. Well, good news that you just presented today. And so I, all our awards are in the back, and you can see them, the awards that we received last year. So I want to thank you for that and the recognition that you have given the city of Hollister. Thank you. And thank, thank you to the city for all the fantastic work you've done to earn those rewards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any, do we have any speaker cards? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you again for the update. All right, we're going to move to item G4. Good evening, Mayor Velasquez and council members. This is a re report on the most recent Pinnacle Gateway Partner Meeting. It was held on May 17th at the San Juan Batista Mission Education Center. The, uh, the, there was a report as typical from the superintendent, maybe some noteworthy things. Uh, they, in your report, it mentions that there was an opportunity to bring a lot of students from the gateway communities into the park. Part of, uh, some of it was for overnight trip and others it was day trips. Some of this was support with, from the Monterey County Foundation and also the Pinnacles Gateway Partner National Park Foundation. The park has a public comment period right now for plans to establish a new east interest station that would be closer to Highway 25. Right now, they're having a harder time with uh, collecting fees because of the way the entry station is. And I, they think it will also help them with some traffic management when they have uh, peak usage, which seems, to, I think I've explained before that now the busy season starting earlier in February and the busy time of day is longer. It's now from nine to three. They also shared information on the National Park Service visitor spending effects, economic contributions of national parks to the local economy. Uh, in 2017, there was reported 233,334 visits to Pinnacles National Park. 
two thirds of those go to the east side. That means they're going through Hollister or near Hollister to access the park. Total visitor spending in 2017 was $13,340,000. 171 jobs. They estimate the la labor income to be uh, six million, six and a half million, and the uh, economic output was 16 million, 391,000 dollars, and percent of visitor spending from non-local visitors in 2017 was 95 percent. Wow. There was a the focus of the meeting in May was transportation. For this reason, there, were, there was quite a few representatives from Caltrans District 5. There was a representative from the Transportation Agency for Monterey County, Monterey Salinas Transit, AMBAG, San Benito Transit. And the, as I said, the, fo the focus was transportation when this organization was forming. They had a collaborative cl clinic in 2016, and at that clinic, transportation was identified as a project to work on as a, a collaborative with the partnership. Karen Bepler-Dorn, the superintendent, shared some of the challenges that they are having with transportation. The access on the west entrance is on a very narrow road. It's too narrow to accommodate a bus for say if you were to have a transit bus go there it's just too narrow so they have queuings because of the it's so constricted in width the on the east side the there's queuing also and they have shuttle buses within the park and one of the things that Karen mentioned is is that when it's busy that that they are a national park and part of their mission is to protect it as a resource for future generations not just for today. And that when they're managing the, the queuing parking, they're pulling staff away from their normal duties. And then also one of the things that happens with the shuttle is when people get off the bus, it's to, if you just think about if you're look, looking at traffic at an intersection and then what happens to the road when the light goes green, you get a platoon of people <laughs> on the trails it, instead of like cars. So uh, there was quite a bit of conversation. She mentioned that Muir Woods and some other national parks are starting to do a reservation system to help demand, uh, manage the crowds. And some of this, there was a group discussion and the gateway communities chimed in on some thoughts they had. I think King City and Hollister both expressed a desire for park and ride lots or in our downtowns and to look into the feasibility of a shuttle service so that we can have the tourists come park in our downtowns, go to the park and come back and then hopefully eat in our restaurants or stay in our hotels or see what stores there are or things to do in our downtowns. The, some other suggestions were a traffic information radio system, electric signage av advising motorists that the park is full. Some of the logistical challenges of that is being able to communicate that and then also Caltrans requirements f for signage on this state highway. It, it could be tricky finding a place where to put that that doesn't violate Caltrans. It was suggested that we as a gateway partnership to maybe start looking at strategies to improve messaging to let people know the best times to visit the park using KSBWA, AAA visa, and other media outlets. See Monterey, which is the Visitors Bureau for the Monterey Peninsula cities. Uh, they have a $7 million budget, I think. They, they said we should be using them to just let them know when to come to the park and weekdays are best instead of weekends. One of the things that was discussed also is there's a sustainable community strategy planning grant cycle that will be available for application in October. And Caltrans mentioned they, they would support uh, effort of the gateway communities to apply for this grant. Then it was a little comical. There was like the hot potato, who's gonna do the grant? 
it was suggested that be AMBAG and that there be uh, maybe a MOU or something like that with the Gateway Communities for the grant. There was a staff person from AMBAG that wasn't in a position to commit one way or another. But the transit agency from Monterey County offered to put it on their, their next agenda. There's a technical advisory committee meeting with COG this week, and so we'll be bringing it up at that meeting at the report section of the meeting. So we're hopeful that that might be a way to fund feasibility studies to see how we can get a shuttle or some type of transit service to the park and then also uh, give us an economic lift instead of people just driving by our communities. The steering committee after the meeting, the, the part-time coordinator shared a draft brochure with 101 things to do on Highway 101 and hidden gems. A lot of those hidden gems are in our gateway, the east side gate of the gateway community. There was also a discussion of the budget for the next fiscal year and each community was committed to trying to see if they could uh, have $2,500 earmarked in the budget for the, to continue the part-time coordinator. So we would like direction from the city council to include that in the development services division budget that amount $2,500 as a line item to continue the, the funding the part-time coordinator for the partnership. They're responsible for putting together the meetings and the minutes and the part-time staff is, I think I've probably mentioned to you, he's uh, started the Salinas Valley Visitors Bureau and he's was successful in getting the Visit California into the city of Salinas. And so he's interested in expanding that. So I think we're fortunate from the standpoint that he's, he's doing a job, but I think we're, he's doing extra because this is part of what he's passionate about. Good, is that it? That's it. Any it, questions from council? So any direction on the budget? Vice Mayor Luna has a question. Okay. Mary, I just have a question. Being that this is a regional inter, uh, well, governmental agencies uh, coming together, and you're asking the city of Hollister for $2,500. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, what is the county? The submit, I mean. Last year, the, the county was the only entity in the partnership that didn't fund the full 2500 there I think it was an allocation from Supervisor Munzer but of the other there was Monterey County City of Gonzales City of uh, Greenfield City of Soledad City of San Juan Batista uh, all these gateway communities contributed $2,500 so San Juan Batista was included in the yeah 2, they paid the full 2500 Okay, so the only one that was in was San Benito County? Correct. Okay. I don't have any problem with the 2500 but I just felt like because it's San Benito County and it's governmental agencies, I just wanted to, everybody to be fair and contribute the same, and that's why I asked you that question. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Friend? <clears throat> and that was my question, too. Is it just a one-time $2,500 a year? Yeah. That doesn't seem like very much to contribute. Council Member Clark? I'm fine with it as well, and thank you for all your hard work on this, Mary. Okay. <coughs> thank you, Mary. I'd like to. Wait, look, do we have a speaker card? Um. Marty Richmond? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what would it be if I didn't say something? You'd think I wasn't here. Goodbye. Marty Richmond from Hollister. Uh, yeah, $2,500 is piddling. What did they say? 95% of the money comes from out, outside the area? Uh, yeah, that's the San Benito County method of investment. 95% money comes out of the area, they can't find 2,500 bucks. Well, I feel sorry for them, I really do. Things are tough at the county. Anyway, uh, 
I think we ought to get aggressive, and here's what we ought to do. We ought to, I know it's a regional thing, but, but and it will be approved on a regional basis, but we ought to be, uh, there's an old saying, uh, I think it comes from the Civil War. It's be there firstest with the mostest, okay? And uh, the one who's going to win this, uh, this uh, battle, and it is going to be a battle for the people who come to visit the park, is whoever gets the best plan for moving them in and out and to do that without polluting, as you saw earlier, the greenhouse gases. We got a heck of a we got a heck of an advantage. We've got the golf course that everybody's trying to get rid of up there, for a campground and a place to got a big parking lot across the street and a place to park, and a place you could run electric or natural gas vehicles, uh, buses, basically, so down that road. I don't want to see that become a four-lane road, not because. I'm worried about uh, the traffic, but uh, the reason is you lose the flavor of what you're looking at, which is old California. As you go down that road, I know it's not a dusty uh, road uh, uh, um, filled with too many potholes, but the flavor of it is you see, you see what California kind of looked like before it got developed. And you don't want to lose that flavor, and I think the flavor of having a two-lane road keeps the traffic slow and lets you enjoy what you see. I think we ought, we ought to encourage somebody to, uh, to get in the business of uh, opening up a, a, um, a campground or, and or a place where people can park and take buses down to Pinnacles and uh, basically keep that road and also not cool and also have a good time and know when they get there, they're going to be able to get into the park rather than get on 25 feet sign that says, I'm sorry, we're full. I don't think that, if it was me, I'd be saying, oh, darn, or worse. So I thank you, and that's my idea. Let's get there firstest with the mostest. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no more speakers, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. I, there, I, I just want to clarify that the county did I think they paid about 1300 last year. 13. So they're making their way there. <laughs> Another 1200 and All right. I think there's a consensus to go ahead and move forward with the 2500. Very important. No doubt we received that back. So, thank you very much for the update. Sure. We're going to move to item G5. G5, this is a report regarding, uh, it's a request to reconsider placing a gateway sign at the soon to be constructed roundabout at 4th Street and Graff Road. The City Council may recall that in 2015, we requested that the City Council request approval of COG for $50,000 to put a gateway sign for Pinnacles National Park at the planned roundabout at 4th and Graff Road. Uh, then we, that was approved by the City Council and then the San Diego County Council of Governments. We then issued an uh, open anonymous competition for the gateway sign and that was selected. You have that in your packet. I think you've seen the Condor before, that the concept and it's for 19 feet by 20 feet. And as has been explained previously, when the general plan was revised in 2005, that there was a whole new vision for the west side of Hollister. It wasn't commercial zoning or highway commercial. It, it, it was changed to West Gateway to become a entry to into the city and a mixed use corridor. We, the redevelopment agency in support of that uh, funded the preparation of the beautification plan for the West Gateway. I think sometimes when we have these plans, it's hard to see the, the future because this one has been slogging really slow because of the elimination of redevelopment. That was the primary funding source. So we're doing the first phase. Uh, as you know, at the last city council meeting, you issued the, uh, authorized the issuance of the plans and specs for this. And so we're before you tonight to ask you to reconsider uh, putting the 
gateway feature at the roundabout at 4th and Graff. I know we talked at prior city council meetings about building three roundabouts to have continuity in the city and then also placing one at the intersection of Highway 25 and San Felipe Road. We now know with the Highway 25 re route realignment that we'll probably need to relocate the welcome sign that we have. We know now that it's, it's pretty expensive to get an encroachment permit from Caltrans, so that, that's probably not feasible. And we made some preliminary inquiries with property owners, and that doesn't seem to be feasible either. Part of the reason we'd like to have you reconsider placing the sign at 4th and Graff is, is again, this is, this is an area in our community that really is in transformation. If you think about the master plan we have for the Riverside Park or whatever you want to call the park, that we're going to have, that's going to be a regional draw. People are going to be coming from out of the area, and this gateway feature can really establish presence. We also are working on getting funding for the Riverside Trail from Bridge Graff Road. There's plans in there for a staging area. So again, people love to walk. If we have people staying at our hotels, they may be walking on that trail or people may be just coming besides the residents here. So what, what I'd like to recommend is that the city council provide direction to have the gateway feature put in the plans and specs for the roundabout. And also the, the, there is two things to consider. One is if, it's the, if the gateway feature is 20 by 19 feet, that cost is $74,352. So there would be a need for a supplemental appropriation beyond the claim for $50,000. City Council wanted this gateway feature to be uh, within the budget of 50,000, then it would be reduced 40% in size. It would be about nine or 10 feet. The, the sign company thinks that would really take away from the impact of the sign. But we're seeking direction. We're recommending that we have a nice gateway feature. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, Councilmember Friend? Um, um, are, are you going to put the sign in the middle of the circle or is it going to be? It would be in the middle of the circle. So that's going to block the view? No. The, um, the we had a peer review of the roundabout design that was done by OmniMes, their traffic engineers, and they had some, they made, there was quite a few adjustments made to the design of the roundabout. And when they did the peer review, they had the renderings for the 19 by 20 foot uh, condor in there. Okay. And they determined that there wouldn't be any issues okay. with sight line. Vice Mayor Luna. Yeah, Mary, my question is uh, the 50,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is sufficient funding in the local transportation fund, correct? Yes. Okay. So. <coughs> That would be just coming directly from that twenty-five thousand from the general fund. Yes. Okay. All right. That was my question. Okay. Councilmember Clower. Do we expect the Vista de Oro improvements to be done at roughly the same time as the roundabout and the rest of the West Gateway beautification? Yes. The well. This. Let's see, the, this, there's the Pacific West. They're building some of the frontage improvements from Clipstock. Miller Avenue to maybe just roughly across from Shop and Save. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, remain, the balance would be constructed with the plans and specs that will go out. Okay. So this is kind of the last piece of that whole stretch on the north side? Right. We've, we've been talking about this for a long time, so I'd, I'd like to get moving on it and add it in with everything else. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any <laughs> speaker cards? Marty Richmond. Uh, does the Do we have sufficient funding in this to... Um, 
have some anti-vandalism uh, construction around it and or uh, have the sign made with the new anti-vandalism stuff that they make it with. I, I forgot what it's called. To keep people from spray painting it, you can wipe it right off. It will not, simply will not stay on there. I also would like to see, I hate to say it, but I, I think we're going to see some fencing, not 10 feet high, but something that basically says, hey, uh, you know, it's going to be in the middle of, a, of, a, of an area where people have access. And it's unfortunate. I never understood that particular criminal bent on vandalism. You see something nice, you just want to ruin it. But some people have that bug. And uh, I would hate to see us spend 50000 and have it uh, not be protected. I'd rather spend seventy-five and have it be protected. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. There are no more speakers, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. We can check on the, the company signed by Vans that this is what they do. They make signs. So I, I would guess that they would incorporate that in their materials, but I'll verify that. Vice Mayor Luna. So, Mary, um, if the recommendation is that it is protected, uh, I would believe that no matter where the roundabout is, if whether it's in the west side, north side, east side, west side of the city of Hollister, then both roundabouts be treated the same. So it's not just because it's on the west side. Oh, I want to make sure with that, the sign. that people yeah. realize that. This is the city of Hollister. We're not going to protect one. We're going to protect all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. Is there a consensus from the council on? Yes. yes. On the twenty-five. Yeah. Okay. There's a consensus for the. Thank you very much. That's going to be super cool. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move to item G six. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Amber Cameron. I'm an assistant planner with the City of Hollister. Tonight, staff has prepared a report regarding recreational vehicles and boats pursuant to Section 10.10030, private property, parking, and storage of recreational vehicles prohibited by the City of Hollister's Municipal Code. Um, on February 19th, um, 2012, the City of Hollister Council adopted an ordinance 1091, an ordinance implementing section 10.10030 of the Hollister Permissible Code, which prohibits the parking and storage of any recreational vehicles and boats on private property unless parked or stored in a garage or structure that is fully enclosed and is located in a legally permitted rear yard or side yard pursuant to Chapter 17 of the Hollister Permissible Code. Um, for the purposes of fully enclosed, this means that the garage or the structure that provides the coverage for the recreational vehicle or boat covers all four sides so that no part of the recreational vehicle or boat can be seen outside of the garage or structure. Um, I also thought that it was important to note that within our code, um, section 10.10.10, um, the definitions for recreational vehicles include auxiliary dollies, buses, commercial coaches, um, <coughs> mobile homes, motor homes, motor trucks, semi-trailers, sorry, um, tent trailers, trailers, and truck tractors. It is the desire of the council to direct staff to work with the planning commission in preparing an amendment to the RV and boat ordinance. The following revisions to the codes would be discussed and considered. The parking and storage of RVs and boats would be permitted outside a structure on a paved driveway when space is not available in the rear or side yard or the lot is not on a corner and has no reasonable access to either the side yard or rear yard, provided that all the following conditions exist. Condition 1, inside storage is not possible. Condition 2, the vehicle is stored perpendicular to the front curb. Condition three, no part of the vehicle extends over the public sidewalk or the public right-of-way. 
Condition four, no more than one recreation vehicle and one boat may be stored or parked in the front yard of each single family residential unit. Condition five, the vehicle is parked or stored at least three feet from the side or rear property lines. Condition six, the vehicle does not block access to or occupy any required parking access or spaces. In addition, stored recreational vehicles and boats shall not be used for any dwelling purposes, um, permanently connected to sewer lines, water lines, or electricity, temporary electrical connections for charging batteries and the use of electricity or propane fuel would be permitted, but only when necessary to pre prepare a recreational vehicle for immediate use. Use for storage of goods, materials, or equipment other than those considered to be a part of the unit or essential for its immediate use wouldn't be permitted. Staff would like to take direction from the City Council as to whether staff shall work with the Planning Commission to consider permitting the storage and parking of recreational vehicles and boats outside a structure on a paved driveway only when space is not permitted in the rear or side yard or the lot is on a corner, not on a corner, excuse me, and has no reasonable access to either side yard or rear yard. In addition, staff would also request direction from the council to define the maximum period of time in which an oversized recreational vehicle or boat may be permitted on any public or private street, public off-street parking lot, or any other public property for the loading, unloading, cleaning, and routine maintenance and repair, or in conjunction with permitted construction projects. Are there any questions? Well, I'm sure there's lots of questions on this one. <laughs> Who wants to start? I'll, I'll start then. The uh, I think one of the conditions in the past was they have to be have a current registration. Is that still part of this? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that should still be the case. Um, we can work with the Planning Commission and require essentially most of the requirements um, that are currently in place in Chapter 10 of the uh, House Municipal Code, um, but work on the um, changes that uh, would be uh, more suitable for RV and boat or parking. The last time we had this conversation, we were looking into what San Jose's code was on this. Did you draft any, take any information from their code to make sure what they were doing? Yes, um, we've actually been looking at several cities within the area. This particular one highlights um, many things that are within Gilroy in particular, but we're open to if there's more specific cities you would like us to focus on, including San Jose, we can do that as well. And one more. I, I noticed you, you did uh, catch the, has to be on the driveway. I think part of the problem in the past was people were creating new driveways on the neighbor's other side of the yard there. So very clear that's not going to be tolerated at all. And those that are out there now, I mean, are, are we going to be able to start enforcing that? Is that what we're hoping to do here too? Yeah, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. One of the requirements that we have in our zoning code actually indicates that uh, driveways uh, should there's a certain requirement regarding um, how many drivers can be on a property. And so um, essentially it's one, one driveway per property. Um, there can be a potential for two with certain requirements. Um, I believe it's a, if it's in a corner lot and it has um, access on two sides, but it's really rare to have a second driveway approval on, on a property. Well, and that, that was going to be the next point because people are using the handicap ramp yeah. as a driveway for their additional cars on on their house so how are we going to make sure that's not becoming the new spot for all these things i mean that's that's, that's you see that happening all over the place and the curbs are being damaged by this and we're having to go back and fix it so well that's a good point mr this mayor this is going to become an issue so i want to make sure we have an answer to that that's a good early point, mr. on mr. yeah those ramps um sidewalk ramps are, are not for vehicle access and that that's uh, prohibited um, so yeah that would be a, a, a violation of the code and and there can be a code enforcement action for that absolutely council member friend I just wanted to bring I, I I brought this to the to the uh, 
mm -hmm. engineering department. And the reason I brought it to them is it's been pointed out to me and I did some research. Um, there is no place to rent to park your RV between San Jose and King City. There's one place in King City available. And I just noticed that there was a lot of people that were not able to use their small, and I'm not talking about 40 foot pushers, talking about the small ones that fit on their driveway or a boat, a family boat that fits on their driveway. Um, and, and she's right, the, the paperwork that I brought for them to look at was from the city of Gilroy. It's basically their same, most of what's in the new ordinance or the proposal is from the city of Gilroy. So we looked around other cities to look and see what was available. And I understand what the discussion about was people parking on lawns, people doing maintenance on their, on their you know, uh, cars and trucks in their driveway for weeks on end and stuff like that. And I know the 72 hour rule that's currently in place does not seem to be a problem because most people are storing their vehicles now, they're storing them sometimes 30 miles away, but they bring them to the house and they know they only have 72 hours to, to set it up and, and use it and then take it back to the house. Yeah. So. It wasn't that big a change. All it does is allow people with smaller motor homes and smaller boats to be able to put them on their driveway. That's right. all. Vice Mayor Luna, comment? Abraham, I have a question. So in addition to your driveway, if somebody builds or cements an additional area in front of their house and parks another vehicle there, truck or whatever it may be, and then all of a sudden they fence it and they put a sign in front that says no parking here. And yet it is the sidewalk. It's an area for the city. It's a, I mean, it's a public parking, city street. How, wh how does this address it? Good question, Council Member Luna. The uh, city of Hollister currently does have a code. It was mainly established to manage stormwater um, in, in, on properties, mainly on front yards. So currently our, our zoning code has a stormwater management section that indicates that, that the front yard could only be cemented if it's six feet wide to the, from the driveway to a walkway to the front of the house mm -hmm. and a six foot wide walkway from the driveway to the rear of the house. Everything else has, has to be permeable. And so um, that, that would be so under that existing ordinance, we, the city would not permit for any other areas in the front yard to be um, cemented. Uh, the city doesn't have much regulation on rear yards, um, just that uh, the property itself cannot be covered with more than 50% of structures on, on the lot, meaning that if it's a 6,000 square foot lot, no more than 3,000 square feet, including the main house and the garage, cannot, um, there cannot be more than that covering the, the lot. So we would be able to, to address it that way in the front yard. The, um, the parking in the front parallel to the, to on, on the public right of way, mm -hmm. that's, that's where um, Council Member Friend indicated in regards to the 72 hours. Uh, currently the, the code indicates that if, if the family wants to go camping, for example, and, and they do have a large uh, oversized RV that, that cannot fit into the driveway that, that is too large and it encroaches onto the sidewalk, then in that case, it has to be an, it can't, it has to be stored in a proper area, not not in a residential district. But if they do want to bring it out, safe to for maintenance purposes, or if they want to get ready to go camping, they then they can come and, and bring it and be able to load and unload for 72 hours. Um, you know, and after those 72 hours, then then uh, the police can respond for possible citations if if they do have it for longer. Okay. And um, and that was one item that we were asking also direction to review if we want to change that, if, if 72 hours is, is not enough. Um, but in here, Mr. Council Member Friend, it sounds like people have been reacting positively to the, to the existing rule. So we, we, can, we can certainly leave it. All right, thank you. Council Member Clower. Yes, thank you for the report, Amber. Um, I agree with Council Member Friend that I think 72 hours is more than long enough to, to charge up and load up your RV or do whatever you gotta do to your boat to make sure it's ready to roll. Um, I think Abraham brings up a really interesting point. When you drive down a lot of the new subdivisions, 
I'd say probably 25 to 35 percent of them are extending their driveways already. It may be by three feet, it might be by six feet, it might be by 10 feet, but they're adding concrete. And this is one of the main reasons that they're adding the concrete. I think that staff has done a lot over the last few years to help beautify the neighborhoods that come into town. I think we've still got a ways to go, but they're a lot better than what they were 20 years ago when it was pretty much different shades of brown every single house and look exactly the same for hundreds of units. Um, I don't really want to see our neighborhoods turn into parking lots for RVs and boats. And I know, I know that I have a lot of friends who aren't going to be happy about that because they've got tra travel trailers and stuff. But I don't think that that's from an aesthetic point of view. I think that defeats a lot of the things that we've been trying to do as a, as a planning department. Um, so if there's some little things that we're going to tinker with in the in the ordinance to make it more to make it have more sense uh, the municipal code then i'd be fine with that but if we're trying to open it up so that anybody can park something in front of our house i'm not really interested in that um, so that's kind of where i'm at thank you yeah the only concern i had with this and i don't mind people parking their boats or smaller trailers in front of their in their driveway i do have a concern about that driveway spreading all the way to the front yard and the conversation about a hard surface or or not you know it doesn't take long for people to figure out if they just put some paving stones down it meets the requirement you pointed out so you see a lot of homes like this right now doing it and there's four or five cars parked all the way up to the the bedroom window so we need to make sure we get that in in control i think part of the problem in the past we've had is those driveways are as narrow as the garages and we all know you it's very tough to get two cars into the driveways i don't mind people expanding three foot to the left or three foot to the right but i do mind when it goes further than that and i think we need to be very clear on that and i've seen a lot of the new homes actually using the uh, area uh, just outside of their sidewalk they're filling that in now with concrete so we have to clear that up before we end up with the same situations and then the trees can't get the water they need and they start breaking up the sidewalks and then the homeowners want us to pay for it all again. So let's get all these things cleared up as we're working on this. It's a good point, Mr. Mayor. You're absolutely right. Permeable pavers are allowed in the front yard and so that would be one way to go uh, around that ordinance requiring the, the uh, only the, the solid surfaces to be on the driveway and, and on the walkways. But yeah, we can definitely put something on the zone on the chapter 10 ordinance indicating that something in the likes to where it, it should only be on on the driveway and not um, fronting the garage and not and not anywhere in the front yard well, yeah you know, I, I don't mind them putting pavers there the problem is i don't want them parking all the way up there that, that's kind of my point to it do we have any comment cards on this one no mr mayor okay so that's just your update and you'll bring something back is that all right, everyone? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Move to item seven, G7. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is the designation of voting delegate and alternate for the okay. League of Wait, California no. Cities. Don't be. Seven. Oops, sorry. Platinum <laughs> Peak Performance <Oops>. Award. <laughs> sorry, Danny. Uh, no problem. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. It's with great pleasure that I inform the City Council that the City of Hollister uh, Water Reclamation uh, Facility has earned the Platinum Peak Performance Award from the National Association of, Green, of uh, Clean Water Agencies. Uh, the NACWA is the nation's uh, recognized leader in legislative, regulatory, and uh, legal clean water advocacy. Uh, this award is being presented to the city of Hollister for uh, five consecutive uh, years of consistent 100% permit compliance. That's a pretty big deal for us. And sharing this honor with the city, I would like to acknowledge uh, Jim Heitzman and Jose uh, Rodriguez of Violia Water for their excellent work in managing and maintaining the city's uh, water reclamation uh, facility. It is because of their hard work and unyielding uh, dedication to excellence that the city is the recipient of this prestigious award. So, if I can. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for having us here today. 
I just bring up real quick a couple things. Is one uh, two years ago we won the plant of the year for the Monterey area. This year we voted the third best plant in the state of California. There's some 1,200 plants in California, so it's a pretty big deal when uh, Hollister got that. In the Platinum Award, there are some 50,000 plants throughout the United States. Less than 100 received this Platinum Award, so that's pretty good. But I don't know if it's coincidental or an accident, but since Jose Rodriguez, our chief plant operator, got promoted to chief plant operator, every year we've won the Gold Award or a Plant of the Year Award. So, again, it might be just an accident. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to introduce Jose, who's the heart and soul of the treatment plan. He's not only born and raised in the city of Hollister, but we have uh, five employees, and three of them are all Hollister residents and uh, native Hollister residents. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the city council member, uh, the mayor, um, all, everybody that supports us. Uh, it is not an easy task to run a facility of that magnitude. Uh, it really is state plan uh, a really nice facility, a state-of-the-art um, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, um, and I think the staff that we have there takes it real personal. Um, this is a great achievement for not only myself, but uh, everybody as well. And, and we take pride to bring stuff like this back to the city council members, and we continue, we're going to continue to do this, uh, you know, as far as uh, we're allowed to be here. Uh, we also do a lot of tours. We've toured about 1,000 students every year uh, from elementary school all the way up to the high school. Um, and showing people what type of effort it takes to run that type of facility. Again, it is state of the art, um, and it requires a lot of hard work, dedication, um, and, a, and a lot of uh, consistency throughout the year. Because as the season changes, uh, the, bacteria, the facility is a living organism. It's a biological uh, entity that we have to make sure we stay up top of it. Um, there's a lot of things that is really fun that a lot of people kind of get to uh, see. Um, so uh, it takes a lot of effort, again, and I always invite anybody in the community that is willing to come out to the facility to take a tour of it and show a new appreciation of what it really takes to run a facility like that with the staff that we have. So well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And by the way, it's no accident. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> thank you. We're going to move to Ohio. Item G8. Um, this is for the designation of voting delegate and alternate for the League of California Cities annual conference. I'm not sure if any of you will be attending this year. It will be held in Long Beach, California, September 12th through 14th, 2018. Um, the city should designate a voting delegate and up to two voting alternates if anyone is planning on attending this year. Do we have commitments? Councilor yeah, Frank? Go. You'll be a voting delegate? If, if, or, or Mickey went last year as the as alternate. She can be the voting No, we, we can all go, but if, who wants to be the voting members? I can't, I can't commit yet to being there. Are you going to be there? Okay. So, uh, Vice Mayor Luna, Luna? Councilor Frank? So, Vice Mayor Luna, you will be the voting delegate, and Ray will be the alternate? Is that okay with you guys? Well, do we have another um, alternate? We have two. I don't know if I can go yet. I don't, I don't know if I can go yet. <laughs> I, I live day to day, so three months out's a little okay, ways. Okay, so away. Jim's not here. So pick um, Jim. He's not here. There you go. Right. <laughs> That's usually the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim is the other voting. Al okay. okay, he's the alternate. Tell me it's to pay for his own gas too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, H I J. Move for adjournment. Okay, no business. There's a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Hey, Billy. Billy.